Three, there we go. Okay. So while we're on the subject of uh, authority and expertism, uh, I put up this slide. Uh, one of our uh, read blog readers uh, shared this uh, some time ago, and I thought it was funny. Don't do not confuse your Google search with my medical degree. So we have this notion of the superiority of expertism over just any old schmo who can look up something on on. Uh, Google if they're looking for an answer, especially when it's medical related. So we've got this idea of the supposed of the superiority of expertism over just what any one of us can do. And that kind of prompted me to come up with my I came up with my own coffee mug for this. It says, do not mistake your seminary degree, which taught you to think other men's thoughts with the rational independent thinking and of uh, and discernment of a spirit filled born again child of God. All right. So that's a good cup. So Somebody needs to make we, that. I think we. I think we uh, need to. Yeah, oh yeah, we need. I think to. Tank needs to. Yeah. Make this cup available. We so we've got our. Uh, we've got our no authority T-shirt, right? Right. We've got um. We've got our peer review T-shirt. <laughs> I think yeah. Um. And now we've got the seminary degree right. cup. I think we need to make that happen. I I think there'd be a market for that. Oh yeah. Out there. All right. Take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 9. John, chapter 9. I want to end my series with this account that we find in John, chapter 9, because it presents probably the most comprehensive examination of the thinking and operation of the leadership of institutional religion. Uh, going back to the first session, and if you didn't see the first session, you can go back to the archives. It's also going to be available on the Tank's YouTube page. We'll, we'll put links to all this stuff later. But go back and watch uh, my first session, and I talked at length about the progression of thought of, a collect of the collectivist ideology. Because everything that we see here with this notion of authority is a product of the collectivist mindset because we are talking about the prescription of political force. And that's all authority this that's all an authority is, is an appeal to some kind of political force to coerce you to take a certain action or to behave a certain way. And I think the best example that, of where we see this taking place before our eyes in the Bible is here in John chapter 9. And so I guess you could say that I've saved the best for last. I, I think it's the best. That's my opinion. You might not think so, but that's okay. And I wanted, uh, so I wanted to devote an entire session to the exegesis of this one passage simply because it is rather lengthy. But because it is so lengthy, it bears taking the time to work through it just so we can fully get a grasp of the implications of all that is taking place in this passage. This account takes up the entirety of chapter 9. We won't take time to examine the entire chapter. This is a story that most of you <clears throat> are probably already familiar with. This account in John chapter 9 seems to take place chronolog in, in chronological order immediately after the events of chapter 8. And so we have one of those unfortunate chapter divisions here in our Bibles. In chapter 8, Jesus was in the temple, and we have another rather lengthy passage where John describes in some detail this encounter that Jesus had with the Jews. Now, I've, met, I've used this phrase uh, or this expression, the Jews, several times here in the last couple sessions, um, I want to just take, I think we should take the time to clear, to just clear things up a little bit. Whenever we see this term, the Jews, in scripture, there are a couple of things that this could mean. First of all, it could refer, obviously, to those who are Jewish born, okay, ethnic Jews. 
Okay, if you were born in Israel, if you were born to a Jewish family, you are a Jew, right? Um, the next level that we could take this in this ref in this expression, the Jews, would be a way to refer to not only those who are Jewish born but those who are the most devoted to Jewish orthodoxy or traditions, okay? Because obviously some people are going to be more uh, adherent to certain customs than others. So in any, in any society, in any, in any culture, you are going to have you know, the real hardcore, you know, those who are the most devoted to the orthodoxy, to the traditions. We're going to follow it the most passion. Um, more often than not, this expression, the Jews, refers specifically to Jewish leadership. So you've got the rabbis, the elders within the community, um, the members of the Sanhedrin, which would be the Jewish legislative body, okay, or the various political sects, whether it be the Pharisees or the Sadducees, okay? And of course, the term Jews could refer to all three of those elements, all, you know, all of the above, okay? So in chapter 8, Jesus had this encounter with the Jews, and there's this lengthy exchange, and Jesus makes this well-known statement where he says, before Abraham was, I am. Notice he didn't say before Abraham. That doesn't sound like proper English. You, you don't say before Abraham was, I was. Okay? He uses present tense. Before Abraham was, I am. So you have so using this present tense, you get this sense of continuity from past into the continuing into the present. But if you think of it in terms of the Hebrew language, or what they were speaking in this time was Aramaic, which is a form of Hebrew, um, saying this expression, I am, is the word Yahweh, which of course is the term that Jehovah used to identify himself to Moses at the burning bush. Okay? He said, I am that I am. He said, I am the self-existent one. I exist. I am who I am. And so, at this point in the encounter, the Jews, they just about went ape. Because Jesus was either saying that he existed before Abraham, or he was saying he is Jehovah. Okay? So, the Jews were getting ready to stone Jesus after this, and Jesus just simply turned around and he just casually walked through the crowd and left the temple. And it says he passed by. So then we come to chapter 9. And at the beginning of chapter 9, we kind of pick up and it says, as he was passing by. So you kind of get the idea that there is a chronology here. So chapter 9 happens right on the heels of chapter 8. Right after he exits the temple. So very briefly here, Jesus and the disciples leave the temple, and they see this blind man. Now, at this point, I say, I use the term man here very loosely, and a little bit later on, you're going to understand why. But we are told that this person, this man, was blind from birth. And that's critical to keep in mind. So Jesus sees this man. He makes some, he gets down on the ground, he makes some mud, he rubs the mud on the man's eyes, and then he tells the man to go wash in the pool of Siloam. The text in our in chapter 9 says that the name Siloam means sent. But when you examine the Hebrew word, the word Siloam is actually a transliteration from a Hebrew word. And in the Hebrew, the name of the pool literally means cast out. Okay? Cast out. Now, cast out certainly conjures up a different meaning from simply sent. Okay? There's a similarity there, but you've got to get a different picture. Sent seems to be almost like 
having a purpose. You know, if I send you out to go get pizza, mm -hmm. you know, you're you've got a mission that you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. But to cast out, there seems to be some force with that, or, or there's a negative connotation that goes along with that. And this will have clear implications when we see what happens later at the end. In cases like this, you often have to wonder if Jesus was really trying to send a message with things like this, like the significance of the fact that he told him to go wash in a pool whose that's name meant cast out. We'll come back to that. It would be an interesting study to take an in-depth look at the historical significance of, the, of this pool, but we're not going to get into that here. That's going to be a study, will be a study for another time. What I will say is that this pool served as a fresh water source. It seems that this pool of fresh water was located just outside the southern wall of the temple. And if you remember, when we going back again to our Acts study, um, we did some in-depth, uh, an in-depth study at one time about the temple. And we learned that the southern part, the southern end of the temple was the main entrance. So it, you know, we showed some, I showed some pictures, and I should have taken the time to, now that I think about it, I should have taken the time to put those pictures up here again, just so we can get an idea, just for clarity's sake. But the southern wall of the temple had this huge staircase going up and there were two main gates on either side so this I mean it was massive so it could service a lot of people so this was the entrance that most people used to come and go from the temple um, this is also the place at this southern wall of the temple where a lot of beggars gathered uh, Peter and John in the book, I believe it was Acts chapter 2 or Acts chapter 3, went into the temple and they found the lame man begging for alms on these same steps at the southern, wall, at the southern end of the temple. Okay, um, So it's reasonable to assume that this pool of Siloam was located near this main entrance. And here you have this blind man. And I think it's reasonable to assume that this blind man was also begging. Because you have this pool, this fresh water source where people are coming to get their water every day and also the main entrance to the temple so this is a very public place with a lot of people coming and going and Jesus sends this man to this very public location he says go wash your eyes out in this pool where everyone will see you hmm. so he does this and being a very public place everyone there now sees this blind man who can all of a sudden now see so everyone starts talking among themselves. They say, hey, is that the blind man? I know him. Is, are you, is that the blind man? How is it that he can see now? And so they ask, they go up to him and ask him, to see what's happening? And he tells them the story about how Jesus put the mud on his eyes and told him to go wash in this pool. And so now this is where we're going to pick up the narrative. Because this is where it really starts to get interesting. Because now the Pharisees come into the picture. Our good old buddies, the Pharisees. And as we go through this, I want you to notice just how the Pharisees operate. Let's start at verse 15. Verse 15 of John chapter 9, we read, Then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He, being Jesus, he put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed, and I do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. Now that's interesting. Because first of all, Jesus is considered a sinner because he didn't keep the Sabbath. Now let's think about this for a minute. Let's go back to the Ten Commandments for a second. I think this is the third, this is the third or fourth, fourth commandment, right? Fourth commandment. 
Exodus chapter 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. According to Jewish orthodoxy, Jesus violated the Sabbath. Anyone who does even a cursory reading of the New Testament should be able to come to the conclusion that the Jewish system of orthodoxy was predicated on a justification where perfect law keeping was the standard, right? And the Jews had set up this entire system of traditions whereby if you kept this system, that was the equivalent of keeping the law. Okay? You had uh, the Apostle Paul in Galatians. This is what he railed against the Galatians mm -hmm. for because you had this sect, of, now, this sect of Christianity that had immediately sprung up where they were trying to say, okay, well, yes, you've got to believe in Jesus Christ, <clears throat> but you also have to be circumcised. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because it was still necessary to keep the law. And so by observing this ordinance of circumcision, you were then, that was, in a sense, fulfilling the whole law. Right. Okay? So you still got this notion of some system of orthodoxy that replaces the law itself, but that's good enough to fulfill the law. And then they lived any way they wanted to. Yeah. Because the law was being fulfilled through the ritual. Yeah. Right. And so the Jews had this entire system. Okay, yeah, sorry I said all that. All right. So in this system of orthodoxy, there was an entire section devoted specifically to regulations for the Sabbath. For example, you could only walk a certain number of miles on the Sabbath. It was called a Sabbath, a Sabbath day, a, th a Sabbath day's journey. Um, in the case with Jesus, what did Jesus do? How did Jesus violate the Sabbath according to their orthodoxy? Well, he healed somebody on the Sabbath. Well, healing somebody, that's doing work. Mm -hmm. You have to work to heal somebody. Well, here's the other thing that's interesting. He made mud. And the one about mud is, is kind of funny because this goes to the regulation where you couldn't make bricks. And you have to, and all their, all their buildings were made out of clay bricks. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever seen, um, my kids and I have found this channel on YouTube of these guys in a jungle somewhere in Indonesia. And they make all these great elaborate structures in the jungle out of just the materials there and they build a lot of these things with mud right and they dig up they clear out a big hole and they get some mud and they fill it with water and then they get a bunch of dry grasses and they mix it and they, and they mix up this clay and they use that to cover up their buildings and seal things right up. <clears throat> so jesus made jesus making mud is a technicality where he was making, he's not supposed to do that on the Sabbath. Right. Okay? So the fact that Jesus bent down on the ground and made mud, he violated the Sabbath. Okay? He healed someone. Okay? You're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. Now here's where the Pharisees encounter their first dilemma, and it should be obvious. On the one hand, they have labeled Jesus a sinner because he has violated the Sabbath. But on the other hand, he performed a miracle, which they clearly acknowledge. They can't deny what just happened, okay, but they don't know how to reconcile this now. Okay? He did this great work. How can he be a sinner if he healed somebody? See their dilemma? Now, having said all this, we should be immediately be able to see another problem. And this is a problem with the modern Protestant view on justification. It is no different than what the first century Judaism taught. 
that righteousness is based on perfect law keeping. Do you see where the do you see the problem? Do you see where I'm going with this? And if you don't, um, oh, I, there was another slide I was going to put up. I forgot to put up. But we have um, R.C. Sproul, our good friend R.C. Sproul, mm -hmm. and his quote about double imputation, where he clearly stated that Jesus was right. Jesus wouldn't have this righteousness if he hadn't kept the law. Mm -hmm. He said it. Right. Okay, this is what R.C. He clearly said Jesus wouldn't have been righteous right. if he didn't keep the law. So right. what's the assumption? The assumption here in Protestantism is Jesus' whole basis for righteousness was his perfect law keeping. Mm -hmm. But he didn't keep the law. He worked on the Sabbath. Right. Okay, how do you reconcile that? What's the problem? It's right here. You can't get around it. What about all the other times when Jesus healed somebody on the Sabbath? There's other, there's other accounts where that happened. We can even go to other passages in the Gospels and see other examples of where Jesus didn't keep the Sabbath. Like the time he and his disciples walked through a grain field and they were plucking grains of corn off as they went and ate it. Matt, Mark, chapter 2. Verses 23 and tw through 28. And it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, <clears throat> Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, Have ye never read what David did when he had need, and he was hungered, he and they that were with him, how they went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest? And did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests. And he gave also to them which were with him. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Now, you're going to, all right, I know what you're going to say. Well, Andy, that's, you, that's not right. You, you can't say Jesus broke the law, because... Jesus didn't really break the law. You're talking about traditions of men, right? You're, you're, you're talking about this standard that the Pharisees set up, all these regulations to help them observe the Sabbath. That Jesus was no, under no obligation to follow the Pharisees' man-made traditions. Okay, That's not the same thing as the law. And you're right, it's not the same thing. Neither is it the same thing to say, Jesus keeps the law for us. And that obedience is imputed to us somehow. You can't say that either. Okay? That's not the same thing. But here's the point. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay? It doesn't matter. Look, we can, we can concede that remembering the Sabbath is part of the law. Okay, we just looked at the Ten Commandments. Okay, we read it. Okay, do we agree with that? Keeping the Sabbath is part of the law? Yes? Okay. Here's the point. And I already brought this up. The Apostle Paul bent over backwards trying to make this point clear in both Romans and Galatians. The law doesn't justify. Okay? This is the equivalent of saying, I reject your premise. I'm not even going to bother answering your question because your premise is wrong. Right. Hmm. Okay? The law doesn't justify. Even if you do keep the Sabbath, okay, for argument's sake, let's assume you do. Whether it's the actual law itself or some system of traditions, it doesn't matter. The law doesn't justify. What was the purpose of the law? In the 2014 tank conference, I stood here and I made the case that the purpose of the law was for sanctification. And you can go back to the archives and review that for yourselves. The law was for sanctification. The law was also a will. The law was also a guardian that took Old Testament saints into protective custody. 
But moreover, the law is the vehicle for showing love to God and others. That's the purpose of the law. It was never meant to justify. So, don't stand here and argue with me about make, trying to make these points about Jesus keeping the law or not. It's irrelevant. Because the law was never meant to justify. And I get so frustrated having these conversations on Facebook with people who, who, who can't get their brains around this fact. All right. They're trying, to, they're trying to argue against me by saying, well, yeah, but it, it, they, they, they create their own tautology with this. They say, Jesus, Jesus obeyed the law, therefore he was righteous. Well, Jesus was right, righteous, therefore he kept the law. And round and round and round and round and round they go. And I just want to say, stop! Don't you get it? It doesn't matter. The law doesn't justify. Can we get that through our brains? If you learn nothing else, out of these sessions, the law doesn't justify. Mm -hmm. So keeping it, not keeping it, it's irrelevant. At least for term, for, for purposes of justification. Alright, rant over. So how does keeping the Sabbath show love? How does keeping the Sabbath show love if the obedience to the law, if the law is for the purpose of showing love? Well, first and foremost, it's obedience to God. Okay, John 14, 15, if you keep me, if you love me, keep my commandments. But what was the purpose of the Sabbath? Why did God give man the Sabbath? Jesus said, man, the, the Sabbath was made for man, right? Why did God make the Sabbath? It was to give man a day to rest. Right. Okay. God and knew, animals. <laughs> yeah, God knew that man needed a day off. Right. So he gave us a day so that we could have leisure and not be burdened with the tasks of labor so we could recover and have strength and energy to go back to work and do it all over again. Um, I run a mobile concession trailer, for those of you who don't know. Uh, I have a normal location, a regular spot where I set up throughout the week. I don't do this as much as I used to, but on weekends I used to do special events from time to time. Um, and I did this, uh, one of my, one of the biggest events I did was for uh, Otterbein University for their equestrian program. Every, every once in a while they would have like uh, an equestrian tournament and they'd have schools from, from Findlay, from Miami University, uh, Bowling Green, they would all come and have this big equestrian tournament go on, and they would have me come in and serve food for their tournament. And uh, generally, usually it was only one day, it was only usually, usually like on a Saturday. Well, there was this one time where there was this big regional tournament that they had, and it was going on and going on for two weekends. It was going to be a Saturday and Sunday for two weekends in a row. So they wanted me there both, they wanted me to go there both days, in addition to me working Monday through Friday at my regular spot throughout the week. So I worked 21 days straight without a day off. And I tell you, I was so exhausted. I actually had it, by the time it was over, I actually, take, I actually ended up taking the next Monday off after that, I remember, because I was so beat down and mm -hmm. worn out because I worked 21 days straight without a break. I was so exhausted. And I said, I never want to do that again. I'm never doing that again. Never. And I understand the importance of why God made a day of rest for man, because he knew we needed it. You know, you gotta you gotta understand that. Okay? Man needs a day off. And this is first and foremost loving ourselves. Because we recognize our need to recuperate. Mm -hmm. Recognizing that need of ourselves motivates us to recognize that same need for others. Okay? If you're a business owner, you give your employees time off so they can rest. Okay? Business owners, don't make your employees mm -hmm. work seven days a week. Right. Give your employees a day off. Okay? Chick-fil-A closes on Sundays because they're a Christian organization. And 
I understand. And while their motivation as being an evangelical Christian organization, it just beeped. While their motivation as an evangelical Christian organization may be law-based, may, may be still under law right. thinking, yeah. in principle it's a good thing because right. they give their employees a day off. Right. Corporate, corporate wide. So mm -hmm. every place there's a Chick-fil-A store, it will never be open on a Sunday. Okay. They give their employees a day off. Uh, in fact, I know of a car dealership in, in Westerville, which is just north of Columbus. They're also closed on Sundays, and they advertise on the radio, and they specifically say, we're closed Sundays to give our employees a day off with their family. Right. Um, we don't plow our fields so that our, even our work animals can rest. Okay. Of course, now I'm thinking back now in you know, right. first century times. Okay, you know your beasts, in of, your beasts of burdens need time right. need to rest. Okay, and speaking of animals, what is this? Matthew 12. Mm -hmm. He said unto them, Jesus said unto them, What man shall there be among you that? shall have one sheep, and if it fall into the pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold of it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath day. And of course, he spoke this in response to, on the heels of just having healed somebody on the Sabbath. See, Jesus had the right understanding of the Sabbath. Let's get rid of this notion that Jesus was righteous because he kept the law. This has, the law has nothing to do with his righteousness. And it has nothing to do with our righteousness. We are righteous believers. We are righteous because, the same way that Jesus is righteous. Right. Because we are God's offspring. Do you see now why the literal, a literal new birth is so important? Mm -hmm. So as we get back to our passage here, the Pharisees are having this dilemma, and there is clearly a division between them that they're trying to reconcile. So they go back to the blind man, uh, well, former blind man now, and if you think about this, it's actually kind of funny. Look at what they say to this guy. They say unto the blind man again, what do you have to say about Jesus? Okay, that he hath opened his eyes. And the blind man said, he's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him. And I believe that's a reference to, they didn't believe that Jesus was a prophet. He, they, they're either saying they either didn't believe Jesus was a prophet, or they don't believe right. what, the blind man is say, what the blind man is saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Oh, here, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm running ahead of myself, because uh, clearly it's, they didn't believe that the guy was blind. Okay. The Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked his parents, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then doth he now see? Now, notice they're trying to turn this around on him. Okay. They're trying to turn things around. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get the upper hand on this kid, right. on this person. My question is this. Do you really think the Pharisees are genuinely interested in this man's assessment of Jesus? It seems to me that this question is a trap. Mm -hmm. It seems to me they're trying to set him up. Mm -hmm. How is this not the same when a pastor or elder from your church invites you to go out for coffee on his Starbucks exp expense account. Trying to get you to talk about your weaknesses. All right. So what sins have you been struggling with? We have documented case, Paul can attest to this, we have documented case after case where this is a trap right. to put you under redemp redemptive church discipline. Right. And if you don't believe me, I can show you the cases. Paul can show you the cases. Oh, yeah. This is well documented that these things happen. You open up to these guys, and they will use that stuff against you. Oh, yeah. 
This man tells the Pharisees that he thinks Jesus is a prophet. <coughs> so now they think they have something on this guy because if Jesus isn't a prophet, then this man has been lying all this time. So not only are they trying to catch Jesus, they're trying to catch this man as well and use, use him as leverage against Jesus. And there is a motivation behind this, as we'll see in just a bit. And so they go to this man's parents and they say, is this your son? Is he really blind? How do we know he was really blind? How is it possible, if he was really blind, how, how, is, it, how is it possible he can now see? See, they're starting with the assumption that Jesus was a fraud. This is what they want to establish. They want to create mm -hmm. a reality that Jesus can't be who he says he is. And to do that, they have to deny reality. They have to sell you on another version of reality. Now, look at this next part here in verse 20. His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but by what means he now seeth, we don't know. Or who hath opened his eyes, we don't know. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. Why did the parents say this? Because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if any man did confess that Jesus was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Right. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So, you see, there is the motivation that I mentioned earlier. They wanted to discredit Jesus by trying to marginalize any of his potential followers. So they could say, yeah, all these people who follow this guy, this Jesus guy, they get thrown out of the synagogue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So if you don't want thrown out too, then you better not say that this Jesus is the Messiah. And this was a very serious threat to the Jews, to any Jew, because being part of the synagogue was synonymous with your salvation. Yeah. You were no longer part of that local community of people. Chances, chances were, if you got thrown out of a synagogue, you wouldn't be welcome in any other synagogue anywhere else. Mm -hmm. There'd be no place else you could go, because word would get around. And if you weren't part of that community, then you couldn't partake of all the traditions that go along with being a practicing Jew. And if you couldn't partake of those traditions, then you couldn't practice those things that made you righteous. Because according to the Jews, that's how you kept the law. And that was how you were righteous. And that was your salvation. What is that? Salvation by institution. All right. Salvation by church membership. Does any of this sound familiar? Mm -hmm. I know stories of people who have been excommunicated from churches under the guise of redemptive church discipline. And they can't go to any other church, any other affiliated church, because, because the pastor and the leadership does an end, around, end run around them and goes to all those other churches in the area and says, um, this guy's got some issues that he hasn't dealt with. All right. You can't welcome this person into fellowship. Right. It happens. This is also why I find that the name of this pool is ironic. Remember, Siloam in the Hebrew literally means cast out. Right. And now we're dealing with a situation where you have this man and his parents at risk of being cast out of the synagogue. You see why I say Jesus knows what he's doing here? Things like this just don't happen by accident. Okay, this is more than just a coincidence. Now here's the other part of this. The parents want no part of this game. Notice that? They can see what's happening. Oh, yeah. They know that if they don't give the right answer, they risk excommunication. Right. So they just defer back to the man, which makes you kind of wonder if this blind man is indeed a man, okay, with the implications of him being a grown man. 
why are they going to his parents? And so I think there is a hint given in the text when the parents say, notice they say, he is of age. Do you need to even state that if it's apparent he's a grown man? Okay. If he's a grown man, why do you have to say he's of age? Ask him. It's, that should be that should be obvious. Jewish tradition, I think that right. could be twelve years old. Yeah, this is why I think this man is actually a young teenage boy. Right. Okay. This phrase "he is of age" is what's important. Jewish boys come come of come of age at thirteen. Thirteen. For girls, it's twelve. Okay, um, this whole uh, coming of age aspect is really has to, it's more than just a societal thing. It actually means that he is accountable to the law. Um, he, is, he is allowed to pr practice and participate now in all the traditions and become a functioning orthodox individual. Means, meanings, which means he has studied, he has studied enough, he has been taught enough about the law and the traditions that he can now follow them on his own. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is why this is so important. Okay, so he, this boy, even though he's just a teenager, okay, he's already been instructed enough that he knows what's what. He is very well versed now in Jewish law, traditions, cultures, customs, the scriptures. Okay. And he's old enough to be of age, but he still looks young enough that others may not be sure exactly how old he is. So if you see a teenage boy, you don't know if he, around the age of 15 or 16, you don't really know how old he was. Some kids can be 15 and look like they're 12. Some kids can be 12 and look like they're 17. All right, so that's why I think there's a real possibility here that we really are dealing with a young teenage boy, and it's not really mm -hmm. clear how old he is, right. at least to those who are around him, which is why now the Pharisees go to his parents. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now let me ask you this. What parent, what kind of parent willingly throws their 14-year-old son under the bus like these parents just did. Are you kidding me? Even if he is of age, you're going to throw your 14-year-old son under the bus? What kind of parents are these? This is utterly reproachable. So, can you now imagine the abject fear these parents have of these religious leaders? Mm -hmm. They are so scared of being labeled troublemakers. They are so scared of being lumped in with the Jesus crowd. They are so scared of putting their salvation at risk and getting thrown out of the synagogue. They've thrown their own child under the bus. Mm -hmm. Verse 24. Then again called they the man that was blind, and they said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, I used to be blind. Now I can see. Okay. You say this man's a sin you say this man's a sinner. Well, I don't know anything about that. All I know is. This is what I know. I used to be blind. He put some mud in my eyes. He told me to go wash in the pool. Now I can see. Okay? You want me to explain it? Tell you what I know. Okay? You see how he states reality? This is a reality to him. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now look at the rest of this. Look at how this man, okay? Keep in mind this man is probably a 14-year-old boy. Oh, yeah. Okay? Look at how he interacts with the Pharisees now. Okay? Yeah. This is great. This uh, is it kind is. of like trying to get out of trouble. This is great. This is classic teenager. So he says to them again, What did he do to thee? How opened he thine eyes? And he answered them, I told you already. Didn't you hear me? 
Dude, I already told you. Why do you want to hear it again? Are you really, are you interested in being his disciples? <laughs> He's being that stupid. <laughs> Whoa, dude. <laughs> 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 you talk about the guts. He knew wow. Yeah. This wow. is smart, Ellie. Are you <laughs> asking, why are you so interested about Jesus? Do you want to be his disciple too? <laughs> what? It's just, I love it. I love it. They reviled him and they said, Thou art his disciple, but we, we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, this Jesus, we don't know where he came from. And so the man, boy, answered and said unto them, Wow, here it is a marvelous thing that ye don't know where he comes from. And yet he has opened my eyes. Now, we know that God heareth not sinners. Look at, look at that. I love this. We know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. Now, whether or not this is really a 14-year-old boy or a grown man, this interaction is still fantastic. And I think it's even more fantastic when we consider that he's just a young kid. Okay? This guy is a thinker. You see, are you catching this? He's intelligent. He's not attacking them. I mean, he's getting snarky with them. Mm. Okay? But he's attacking their argument. Look at the reasoning he's using with them. He is surgically dissecting their conclusions by tearing apart their assumptions. First, he's incredulous that they don't have an answer about Jesus' origin. They don't know who he is or where he came from. And they are the ones that are supposed to be the theological right. experts. Right. They are supposed to be so studied. He's bringing up points that they should already know. Right. And he says, if this is so, okay, here's my argument. Premise what? Premise A, premise B. If these things are true, then shouldn't the conclusion be this? No one's ever healed a person blind from birth before. Doesn't that tell you that this man's from God? We know of somebody else that was like this, right? Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus was a, was a Pharisee, a Jewish leader, an expert. And Jesus was incredulous that Nicodemus had no clue what being born again meant. But see, they don't want to acknowledge this. Why? Because it doesn't fit their reality. Right. Remember the philosophical progression of all tyrannies? The philosophical progression of thought of collectivist ideologies? Remember that from our first session? And that is exactly what we are seeing played out here, right before us, with these Pharisees. A religious tyranny. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They are the self-proclaimed arbiters of truth because only they have the ability to bring truth to the masses who are fundamentally undisabled to discern truth themselves. This is their reality. This is the reality that they are trying to compel you to accept. And when you don't, they threaten you with violence. Look at how indignant they become. Verse 34, they answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sin, and thou dost teach us? Where is your theological pedigree, little boy, young man? Have you been peer-reviewed? <laughs> okay. What college did you graduate from? What seminary degree do you have? You're teaching us, you totally depraved one. Mm -hmm. 
You are the one who doesn't understand truth. How dare you stand there and presume to teach us? Any of this sound familiar? Matthew 21, 23. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? Of course, they're speaking to Jesus. Right. How about when you engage with one of these guys on a Calvinist blog, where you get into a discussion on Facebook on a Calvinist post? What are your credentials? What seminary did you go to? Okay, Have you been peer-reviewed? How quick these guys are to demand your theological pedigree so that they can compare it with their own. And if you don't measure up to their standard, they quickly dismiss you and your argument because you aren't qualified to have an objective opinion on a matter. And on a similar note, I got into an abortion discussion with a person on Facebook one time. And where the discussion was revolved around whether or not, you know, abortion should be allowed in cases of rape or incest. And the point that this person was making was, since I've never been raped or I've never been a victim of rape or incest, I can't have an opinion on the matter. Right. So, basically, my lack of experience disqualifies me from making objective conclusions, is what he's saying, which I, pat which I patently reject, because we're not talking about ex exper experiential ish matters here, we're talking about ethical matters, we're talking about ideologies. My ideology, my progression of thought, leads me to certain ethical conclusions that transcend my experience. Right is right and wrong is wrong regardless of what I've experienced. Mm -hmm. So yes, I can make an objective judgment in cases like that. Okay? Same thing here. Alright? How about when you have that private discussion with your pastor in his office about something he said from the pulpit last Sunday and you disagree with his conclusions? Well, you know, the Bible warns us against having our own private interpretations. <laughs> you know, you aren't submitting to my authority. You, I, I'm afraid, I'm really concerned that you just have an unteachable spirit. Yeah. Mm. You think you know more than the pastor who went to seminary? Why, why are you questioning proven doctrine? You're just being puffed up with knowledge. You're being arrogant. And the next thing you know, you find yourself under church discipline. Or, like John Immel showed us two years ago, using Paul's interaction with John Piper at that cross conference, you try to nail down John Piper on a specific point of Calvinism, and then he proceeds to engage in the Calvinist happy dance. He dances from one authority to another right. to another in order to having in order to avoid having to answer a direct question. And then in the end, he tries to claim that he's a biblicist. Alright. But here is the greatest of hypocrisy. You are the one who was born in sin. Mm -hmm. You were the one born in sin. The totally depraved one, so you can't understand truth, because you're totally depraved. Now what should be the obvious question? How are they not a victim of their own depravity? Right. How do they get the epistemological pass on depravity? And what was the end result of this encounter? Did they listen to this man, this boy's reasoning? Were they persuaded by his fantastic argument? Did they concede his argument and even stop to consider it in the slightest? Did they stop to think for even a second that this guy might have a point? Maybe we should think about this. What was the end result? Yeah. Can you 
you see that on the screen? Mm -hmm. Why? Because they wanted their power. Because they wanted their control. You cannot allow, you cannot grant, even for a fleeting second, a free-thinking individual. You cannot concede the rational mind. But yet, these are the same people, these are the same people. One day, these same people are going to stand up and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we not cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. It's the same old song and dance. This very thing happens in churches all over the world to this very day. Protestantism thinks that it gets a pass from error. Let me say that again. Protestantism thinks that it gets a pass on error. No, they are peddling in the very same institutional tyranny that the Pharisees did. Absolutely. It's ironic because pastors will stand up behind their pulpits and declare par Pharisees public enemy number one. Mm -hmm. What do they call them? Moralists. The, the, the L word. What's the L word? Legalists. Oh, legalists, yeah. Okay? You try to keep the law, you're a legalist. You're trying to be righteous. Your righteousness is filthy rags. You need Jesus' righteousness. You need to live by faith alone. And then you try to point out scripture to them and reason from the Bible. No, look, look here, it says this. Oh, well, you're just puffed up with knowledge. You're not submitting. Before you know it, they are running their bastardized form of Matthew 18 on you. Mm-hmm. Right. And the next thing you know, you're out of that church. And you become persona non grata with every friend you thought you had at that church. Mm-hmm. Every friend you thought you, you thought you had. Mm -hmm. Folks, this is nothing new. The writers of Ecclesiastes was right. There is nothing new under the sun. So take heart. Don't let this get you down. Okay? This is not a church issue. This is not really an argument about theology. This is, th these are the logical conclusions. What you see happening are the logical conclusions that result from a system of thought. So, why would it come to us as any surprise to us when we see it repeat itself over and over? Okay? They're just following the natural course of their assumptions. This vicious cycle, this vicious cycle will only end this vicious cycle will only end when you decide mm -hmm. that you will no longer be their slave. Right. 